Good afternoon, one and all. Fellow alumni, student, present Penguin students, and various other amigos. <laughs> and thank you for that splendid introduction, Mr. Kennard. I'm told that when someone in his late 90s starts to speak, he doesn't know when to stop. You will be the judge of that this afternoon. Actually, I entered Pingree in 1923, 88 years ago. <coughs> Since the school is now celebrating its 50th centennial, this means that I have been associated with Pingree for almost 60% of its history. When I first began fifth grade here at nine years of age, I never gave a thought to Pingree's history. Pingree just seemed to have been around forever. One benefit of living to my age is that you come to have a better appreciation for history and the many changes that a long-standing institution like Pingree has experienced during its 150 years. I'd like to say a few words about Pingree's history, both before I arrived and as I have seen the school change and grow. Excuse me, but I'm gonna take a little sip. Let's go back to the Pingree early days. Dr. John F. Pingree was a graduate of Dartmouth in the class of 1836. He was 18. He then took up theology, becoming a Presbyterian minister. He had a church in the village of Fishkill, New York <coughs> for several years, but he had started to do some teaching as well. He eventually found his way to New Jersey, and in 1861, he founded our school in a small house in Elizabeth. At that time, Elizabeth had no high schools. It was a custom for people to go to work after they finished the elementary grades. Up until the 1920s, less than 2% of young Americans earned college degrees. In the 19th century, colleges like Yale, my alma mater, would admit any young man who could pass the school's entrance exams. Schools like Pingree came into existence to prepare the small number of students who wanted to go to college but didn't have access to private tutors. In 1861, Dr. Pingree was not yet Dr. Pingree. In 1868, Princeton awarded him an honorary degree and from that point on, he was officially Dr. Pingree. Dr. Pingree always wore a stovepipe hat. I think that there were at least two reasons for that. <clears throat> One, it was always a sign of dignity, and those in leadership roles in those days, like Abraham Lincoln, my goodness, usually wore that type of hat. And secondly, Dr. Pingree was relatively short and somewhat stocky. This type of hat added to his stature. The early years of Pingree took place during the Civil War. News of Union victories was cause for great celebration. I like that Pingree, that picture of the Pingree students hanging out when they were granted a day off, or was it half a day, when they got the news that Richmond had fallen. By the early 1890s, Dr. Pingree had been the headmaster of his school for 30 years and was beginning to feel his age. 
So he got together a number of the leading citizens in Elizabeth, including Congressman Charles N. Fowler, and reorganized the school so that it was now functioning under a board of trustees. The congressman served as president of the board from 1892 until 1918, and I think that all who have served on the board will agree that 26 years is a very long time for someone to be president. The congressman saw the need for a larger and more modern building with outside space sufficient so that the boys could do some athletics. The result was the new building on Westminster Avenue and Parker Road in Elizabeth. That was the school I attended in the early 1920s. The congressman served for eight consecutive terms and was chairman of the House Banking Committee. He had a distinguished career. <coughs> in 1892, the new board recruited 28-year-old William H. Corbin, known as Pa, of the Yale class of 1889 to be the headmaster. Pa Corbin had no connection with the family of Horace Corbin, who had been on the Pingree board from 1918 to 1933, and whose family continued to play a part at Pingree for many years. He was one of the men whose advice I sought when I was pondering whether to go to law school. Pa Corbin was the last Yale alum to be head of Pingree until Matt Conard came along. Pa had been captain of the 1888 Yale football team. It was not only undefeated and untied, it was even unscored on. It racked up 698 points to its opponents, zero. He came to Pingree to be the first designated headmaster under the new setup. Pa Corbin's first job was to recruit faculty and set up the curriculum. This he did successfully, but he continued to have a big interest in athletics. When he offered to help the Pingree boys with their football team, they would have none of it. During the Dr. Pingree era, the boys had been allowed to have teams that they set up themselves. There had been no organized athletic program during the Dr. Pingree regime. Pa sat back and watched them during his first year when the boys had a pretty successful season. Then he asked them if they would like to play the school he came from, Westminster, which at that time was a fairly new school in Dobbs Ferry, New York. It moved to Simsbury, Connecticut in 1900. I went there in 1930. The boys accepted this, this suggestion. After all, they'd had a successful season. They thought they would show Pa or thing or two. Well, they learned a thing or three themselves. As Westminster soundly defeated them by a score of 40 to nothing. After that, of course, Pa Corbin became the football coach as well as that master. The team improved every year until in 1897, Pa's last year at Pingree, they won the North Jersey Interscholastic Championship. Pa also created and expanded an athletic program at Pingree. Let's now fast forward to the 20th century. I came to Pingree in the fall of 1923. Calvin Coolidge had just become president after the death of Warren Harding. Pingree was for boys only in those days, and the elementary grades had only one teacher for all subjects. Our fifth grade teacher was Mrs. Wagner. I think she was only a temporary teacher and was only at Pingree for a year or two. <clears throat> there was a bakery in Elizabeth at that time whose delivery vans were emblazoned with the legend 
Mrs. Wagner's pies. We used to kid around saying, how come Mrs. Wagner has time to bake all those pies before coming to teach us? <laughs> Sixth grade was taught by Miss Harriet Budd, who was a glowing light of Ping Reef from 1901 to 1937. She became a legend in her own time. I remember as if it was yesterday her reading to us in the afternoons. One of the books she read to us was called The Reds of the Medi. Recently I wondered if it was still around. I checked the nearby library and sure enough they had it. I reread it around Christmas time. It's still a good tale. Miller Bulari's wife, maiden name, was Elizabeth Budd. She and Miss Budd, Miss Harriet Budd, that is, were distant cousins. Like Miss Budd, Miller, too, has become a legend in his own time, with something over 700 victories to his credit. I was now in the middle school, presided over by Mr. Otto Vars. <coughs> I never had heard the name Otho before or since. So I decided to find out where it came from. I found out that Otho was a Roman emperor and had been a friend of Nero. Unfortunately, his wife Poppea was so beautiful that Nero took a liking to her and told Otho to get a divorce. Otho said no thanks. And for that, Nero got him out of the way by making him the governor of Lusitania. Poppea now got a divorce and married Nero. Nero in due course killed her just as he had his mother and others who were close to him. Then in the spring of the year 68, Nero, at the age of 30, took his own life, fearing what was about to happen to him. Otho did not become his successor immediately, for there was an interim successor senior to him, Galba by name, who became emperor, and who Otho had to arrange to have murdered. That accomplished, Otho became emperor on January 15 of the year 69. And then on April 15 of the same year, Otho, following Nero's example, took his own life. Returning to the 20th century, <laughs> we find Mr. Otto Vars presiding over the middle school and teaching the seventh grade. He presided a good deal longer than the Emperor Otto did. Mr. Vars was there for many years and was highly respected. I have very good memories of him. My last year at Pingree was 1926, which in that, then incidentally was the first year I heard the word sesquicentennial. That word was much in use in 1926 during the celebrations of the 150th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. 